My name is Stefan Jones. I am a fishing guide here in West Wales. My main species or the main species that I do guide on is sea trout or seawin as they are known here in Wales. And I have done so for uh, more years than I care to remember, uh, but it is, I think this season was 26 years. I actually started guiding uh, people onto sea trout when I was 15. Uh, so I think it's fair to say I've got a, a, a few years uh, experience under the belt and um, I hope or, or I like to think a few happy uh, happy smiling faces over the year as well uh, over the years as well and uh, yeah it's uh, it's nice to start people off on the on, on the sea track road it's a couple of hours before it's uh, before it's dark I've actually got the the river Tyvee uh, in the background here so I thought I'd take this time just to talk through basically what I carry nowadays in terms of tackle what I believe you should be carrying in terms of tackle just to make your process or the, the the learning curve a bit easier for you because you can end up and honestly I, I've been through the same mistakes so it's a case of learning from my mistakes and also these are a lot of the mistakes that I see season on season when people come to fish with me here on, on the River Tyvee. So again I'm hoping this will hold you in good stead if you're looking to get into sea trout fishing or if you're already, if you do already sea trout fish but are looking to yeah just, just yeah, expand it or get into it deeper essentially. First and foremost, I've got a rather shameless plug. This is my book, uh, specifically on sea trout fishing. It covers everything from targeting in the daytime with dry fly, nymphs, traditional stuff. It even covers spin fishing, even covers bait fishing. And there's also chapters in here about targeting them in, uh, in a loch or lake environment and also in the saltwater environment as well. So a bit, bit of everything going on there. If you haven't got the book, uh, well, shame on you to begin with, uh, but if you haven't got the book, I, I would recommend you getting it because it will, again, help you on that learning curve. And it's, it's very much a resource to, to go back to now and again. Uh, it's cut up in, into individual chapters to make the learning process or the absorption a lot, a lot easier. You can get it, I'll put a link up above if you want to get it directly from me, I can personalise and sign it for you. Or there's a, quite a few uh, different shops across across the UK stock it, such as Cochabon, the Sport Fish, Gary Evans. There's a lot of, lot, of, lot of places that have kindly given me support on the book. So first of all, most if you haven't got the book, I think you'd find that a, a really useful resource to turn to. So with that, again, shameless plug out of the way, let's get into what I would normally carry. There's a few things that I want close to my person at all times, especially at night. You haven't got the luxury of looking around and seeing where everything is at, at night because it's dark, obviously. Um, so I like to have a pair of forceps, a pair of nippers and a small torch always on my person just within easy reach at all times. Those are three critical things before you start going into the main tackle items. I like to have those three items in, 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 again, in close proximity. The torch, the torch usually acts as, first of all, is a reserve torch. Nowadays as well, your phone can be a reserve torch as well. So in the days where you used to carry a second torch with you, you don't need to so much nowadays. You can actually carry uh, your phone as a reserve torch. I like this one though, it's not so bright. So if I do need it for a, you know, a knot or even finding my way through a small path down to the river, rather than using a full beam, that's really useful. Uh, again, as are your nippers and forceps, just things that you need always close to your person. Waders. I love these Reddingtons. I think I'm on my third pair over the years now. Uh, I've tried through a bit of everything. Personally, I love the Reddington waders. But regardless, chest waders, for the majority of circumstances, you will need chest waders. Even if it's a case of just sitting down on a wet riverbank or whatever. You know, seldom that you have to go over your waist, in fairness. But it's just good to have that as a backup, especially at night. You might just go in a little bit deeper than you think. And again, it's harder to monitor without the light levels there to, to give you the obvious signals. So, yep, uh, chest waders, boot wise, personal preference. I've tried a bit of everything. I've actually gone back to stud and felt. For the rivers that I tend to fish on, I want that level of grip essentially. And I have not found anything to beat 
felt and stud. I've tried rubber, rubber and stud, all this kind of stuff, and honestly, nothing comes close to felt and stud. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful, uh, obviously, with carrying, um, carrying stuff from river to river or from a lake environment to a river environment. Uh, so you have to be a little bit careful with perhaps washing down if you are swap, uh, swapping river sources. But again, from my personal perspective, in terms of grip in the river, felt and, uh, felt and stud are the, are the way to go. The other thing I wouldn't be without, for obvious reasons, is a net, and a decent sized net at that. This is actually an antique net by a company called Whitlock, uh, no longer producing unfortunately, but really fantastic net. So a decent sized net, but also I like one that hasn't got a, a spiky end down here. So a traditional guy net would usually have a spike down here. What you'll find is with that trailing in the water behind you or on your side, it nearly always catches the line. But with these type of nets, these flip nets, uh, which do extend, yeah, this one extends as well. But with the, with the flip net uh, design, you tend to find that that does not catch catch the line like the a traditional guy net does. So um, I also like this system as well. I, I've replaced the net on this. This is a, a, a rubber uh, rubberized mesh uh, again just from a fish welfare perspective very hard to very hard to beat it doesn't absorb water it doesn't absorb slime so actually it doesn't really get smelly it doesn't rot and also because it's rubberized hooks don't really catch in it either so there are multiple benefits to the rubberized system and yeah but either way you want a good size net especially at night when a lot of the time i'm not turning the torch on to net a fish unless unless it's a very big fish i don't tend to use a, a torch to net the fish and when that is the case there's not much mar well you want more margin for error basically a larger net frame does give that so again something i wouldn't be without a decent sized net rod and reel reel you know as long as it's a smooth drag system it doesn't need to be an immensely powerful drag system rarely will you have to chase after a fish sea trout will tend to be explosive rather than you know wanting to leave pools essentially which uh, salmon sometimes can do that to you a, a sea trout as a rule tends to be quite explosive and burn itself out a lot quicker uh, so as long as drag is smooth it doesn't need to be incredibly strong the weight and length will rather be it will be rather dependent on the size of the river you're fishing the majority of rivers i fish 10 foot 7 weight is the way to go you can go on to an 8 weight as well i tend to nowadays prefer 10 foot 7 weight and i tend to overload the rod system by uh, the, the the line rating by one so i'm fishing a sage x here sage x 10 foot 7 weight absolutely love this rod and then i'm fishing an airflow bomber line in a number eight through that which i am overloading uh, by one line weight which i would recommend in most circumstances however don't take you know anything you can try before you buy i would highly recommend that that's in terms of your rod your line everything just make sure it's a well balanced outfit basically so what i'm doing is, yeah, I, I know this suits it suits this setup very very well and what i do by overloading the rod by one line weight is essentially i'm getting the rod to load up quicker under shorter distances which is really critical when you're doing a lot of hand lining especially and on shorter smaller rivers where you're not aerializing the full head length of the line you want that line to load up a lot quicker and that's what this essentially does it loads up a lot quicker under short, shorter circumstances and that is critical especially when you start to throw around bigger flies or when i'm talking about bigger you know some of the surface lures maybe two to three inches long and they're quite bulky in the air as well so you need that extra substance essentially in the line to turn those flies over i really love this floating line the, again the airflow bomber line designed for casting uh, bomber flies for atlantic salmon so if you talk about you know again our surface it was very similar to that but again i would for night fishing specifically i would overload by one I really like light coloured lines. So again, here you've got a, a white coloured line in the bomber. When you're looking down at night, the lighter the colour is obviously the colour that you will monitor best. So white, uh, white, white is the best colour to monitor at night. White, yellow, pale green, something similar to that. I would avoid olives, uh, stuff like that at night, because they're harder to monitor. You want to be tracking where your fly, your fly line is at all times at night. So again, a light colored line 
really aids with that process and again 10 foot 7 weight for me but again if you're fishing a smaller river you may have to drop down to a 9 foot or whatever that's a personal thing to a specific river but in terms of bigger rivers again I would tend to st still fish 10 foot 7 weights or 10 foot 8 weights they tend to yeah that tends to be a very good go-to but it's also a line uh, also a rod that will lend itself to your reservoir fishing to bass fishing to mullet it covers a lot of different types of fishing so it's one rod that lends itself to yeah, a, a, a myriad of different fishing circumstances so there's your rod there's your reel uh, lines and, and line system i tend to nowadays carry a floating line and then a couple of tips so again i like to keep things on my person or close to my person so rather than having a bag left up in the bank somewhere and going to the end of the pool and then thinking oh i want to go into the next pool but i have to go back up to the top of the pool to fetch my bag and all this kind of stuff i do prefer to carry everything again on my person and these little hip packs just make sure they're waterproof uh, this is the yeti one which does a really really good job so in here i've got my head torch That'll obviously be on my head later on. For the head torches, personal preference, and has been for probably over a decade now, the LED lenses, the lenser systems. I think it's a German company. Absolutely love these. Uh, rechargeable. Even with how much fishing I do, I probably only have to charge this thing once every two weeks or something. Uh, lasts for an incredibly long time. They're a little bit more expensive, but you get what you pay for with, with the lenses. So definitely carry one, one of that. And again, you then have the backup torch on your lanyard or in terms of your torch. So in terms of lines then, so if I'm not fishing a full floater, quite often I'm fishing poly leaders. So I've got an eight foot poly leader in a clear intermediate and I've also got one in a fast sinking here nine times out of ten I'm fishing the clear intermediate that doesn't actually get down very deep people think oh it goes down and it doesn't because essentially the current keeps dragging it back up especially fishing it as a sink tip so more often than not this is actually just to just to break the surface film and stop the flies from skating so I will fish this even in very low water conditions i will still fish this tip just to get the flies below the water surface unless i obviously want to fish up on the surface in terms of surface lures and so on then obviously i am fishing with just a full floater but the eight foot clear intermediate poly leaders from airflow just make sure that you choose them in the salmon stroke steel head strength if you go for the trout strength, they only have a core of around 12 pounds, where these salmon steelhead versions have a core of 24 pounds. This is really critical because a lot of the time, if you fish the trout poly leaders, you're actually fishing a heavier tip at length beyond that. And always think of these as part of your fly line. Don't think of this as part of your tippet or essentially where you're going to attach your flies. This is actually imagine you're creating a sink tip line with these so don't think of them as part of your tippet essentially so you can chop and change between those take it off leave it on whatever but having that just again on your side that you can just chop and change as needed even if you're halfway down through a pool and thinking actually i need to go a little bit deeper or i want to stop that from doing this you have that close close by rather than having to kind of go back up the bank find another reel change this change that so a lot easier to ha ha have it there so i carry those two i carry two spools of nylon as a rule one is a, a spool of fluorocarbon so i don't advocate fishing fluorocarbon at night at all you just don't need it it's as simple as that i tend to fish though before it gets dark when you have a lot of residual light i will fish with uh, fluorocarbon when sea trout essentially a bit more like brown trout in the daytime and when you have a lot of residual light they definitely act more like a, a wary brown trout so with that in mind i definitely prefer fluorocarbon i usually fish that in eight to ten pounds or diameter wise 0.2 this is actually a bit thicker this is 0.26 this is 13 pounds uh, there's actually a bit of color left in the water at the moment so i can get away with fishing slightly heavier this also covers you for general daytime fishing in a falling flood so that's the same system uh, same setup then at night so as soon as we're switching out onto the proper night fishing sea trout are not leader shy people will tell you that they are and they're fishing six pound at night and stuff you know I hate to say it 
they're just wrong. So you try to not lead a shy at night. Whatever they tell you, they're doing something else that's wrong if they're not catching and blaming the leader. It's as simple as that. Sorry to be so dogmatic, but that is the case. Um, unless you have a lot of residual light on the, on the pool, which may be from a lot of street lights or whatever, that may affect things slightly or sway things slightly. But if not, trust me, sea trout are not leader shy at night. With that in mind, I am fishing, and have done for the last few seasons now, straight through 15 pound leader at night. And that is uh, something like Maxima Ultra Green, for example. So the diameter 0.35, even up to 0.38, is totally acceptable and totally fine at night. I actually tend to use a carp fishing mono. I buy them in 1,000 meter spools, and then I just put them onto smaller spools. But yeah, do not go into school of thought that the sea trout are sh uh, leader shy at night. It'll be something to do with the speed of the retrieve, the depth, your approach. It'll be something to do with that, not your leader. The heavier leader strength at night Helps with turnover. If you do the uh, the inevitable overcast into the uh, into the trees opposite or behind you, it helps you get your flies back. It's easier to unpick if you get a knot. Of course, nobody's going to get knots at night. How could that ever happen? That's probably why I night fish so much. Nobody can see the mess I get into. But yeah, so yeah, and also if you hook a big fish, you have that level of control when you hook a big fish you wouldn't have if you were fishing fine an island. So do fish the heavier, heavier an island. Again, fluorocarbon in the daytime and at dusk, at night, just go on to bog standard, tried, tested, trusted, Maxime Ultra Green or something similar, you can't go wrong. Beyond that then, obviously have the flies. So I carry three boxes of flies, but they're three slimline boxes. So there's not huge amounts in each because actually I have now a handful of patterns which I tried and tested, but these are essentially three stages. I'm going to go into flies in another video, but essentially one is the no in particular order, typical with me, uh, and I'm quite surprised they're so 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 tidy with me at the moment. No, isn't normally the case; they tend to come out like a Christmas tree. That one is to fish in the daytime and at dusk. So those are my essentially what I would call small flies. This is the first run through or the first part of the evening. Depends again, I made a bit of a, a mistake there in saying that because it, 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 the size of the flies will always be determined about the, uh, with the amount of residual light. So while saying that is my starting setup, that may end up being the, the only setup I rely on throughout the night. And the fish can dictate that as well. If the fish is still taking, if it's not broken, don't fix it. But yeah, that's, that's then the, the next set, step up. And then if I want something bigger, these are essentially my tandem secret weapons, uh, some Waddington type of stinger type setups in there as well, and also my surface lures. So I have three boxes that I turn to, uh, and these are three stages of my setup basically, and each one will have uh, a different use throughout the night. But as you can see, it's all pretty simple but also really stripped down. So I can remain mobile. I can jump from pool to pool as needed. Uh, if I need to change as I'm working down the pool, if I have a tangle as I work down through the pool, everything is here. Rather than always having to look for four things, everything is close by. The only other thing, yeah, I, I, I don't kill the sea trout anymore. Yeah, most of our rivers do not have the numbers there. You know, if you do want to kill a small sea trout, which is sustainable for your home river, uh, I'm not going to start dictating terms. Just my personal preference. Rubber mesh, for example, I keep the fish in the water at all times. I usually just take a measurement. And there's some really good, uh, even in my book actually, there's some really good length to weight ratios you have nowadays. So I just tend to take a measurement of the fish. You can see I'm not very optimistic. It's only up to 25, 25 inches. But yeah, I tend to just take a measurement uh, and, and, and I'm more than happy with that nowadays. Photograph, you know, you have again the phone uh, the phone's usually on you, take a photo, keep the fish in the water uh, and back it goes. You've got to remember the multi-spawning nature of sea trout. You know, if you take that fish out of the system, which may have spawned six, seven or more times in its life, if you take it out and knock it in the head, it sure as damn it won't do that again. So, I, yeah, do, do what's sustainable for the river. Take the right fish out of the river if you are taking a fish. But beyond that, I hope that me explaining my setup, what I tend to carry around with me, helps you helps you on your sea trout journey i hope it brings you luck the next time you you, you do venture into the darkness tight lines <laughs>